Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? For who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Or does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I will have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as to not make full use of my right in the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together and ask for God's help this morning. Heavenly Father, our Father, what a gift that we have been adopted into your family as your children, not through our work, not through our efforts, but through the work of Christ. That you would give up your precious son to bring many sons to glory. To take us who were far off and to bring us near. To take us who were orphans and strangers and aliens and enemies with you and that you would make us your sons and daughters. And so Lord, we come to you as our father trusting and knowing that you hear us and you care for us. You love us more than we love ourselves. You want what's best for us more than we do. You know what's best for us more than we do. And so, Lord, as we come to your word, we want to humble ourselves this morning and confess we don't know what we need most. We are not all knowing. We are not all wise. Lord, we come to you this morning to say we trust you as our Father. And we ask that you would provide for us this morning what we need. And so Lord, would you minister to us today? Would you open up your word this morning, even as we read things that maybe sound like complicated and detached from what we're going through in our lives, would you open up the scriptures, illuminate them for us this morning, that we might see your heart for us and that you would send us out of this gathering, worshiping Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm sure you've had the unfortunate experience of sitting in traffic uh, in the city of Los Angeles at some point in your life. And maybe you've had the experience of realizing, oh, the reason why there's so much traffic this morning is because the president's in town, right? Sometimes a presidential motorcade will come through uh, different cities as the president needs to visit and he needs to do some business and it really shuts down a city almost. I don't know if you've ever seen a presidential motorcade go by, but it is an absolute ordeal. It is a whole ecosystem of protection. There is so much that goes into a presidential motorcade. 
I, of course, had to Google this because I am not knowledgeable myself, but Google tells me that there can be about 40 to 50 cars or vehicles represented in a presidential motorcade. And they have all different kinds of vehicles present to address different needs. They have decoy cars, they have protection cars, they have cars just simply dedicated to having the right weaponry in order to mitigate any kind of threat that may impose itself. They have electronic warfare sensor vehicles that can take out any bombs or explosives in the area. It is so high tech. There is so much going on in a motorcade. And then there's the vehicle itself that the president is carried in. I think it's often called the beast because it exactly is that. It's basically a tank that just looks like a nice car. It is filled with things. I think the doors are like eight inches thick. There's weapons inside. There's liters of the president's blood in case something crazy happens. It's just an absolute scene. But we understand why it exists. Because we recognize that the president of the United States is one of the most important human beings on planet Earth. Because of the role that the president is in. So there's a motorcade. Anytime a president has to go through a city and be in a vehicle, there has to be this motorcade in order to not only mitigate threats, but clear the way to make sure there are no obstacles in the way of the president. Primarily because the president is just that important. If you and I die, not much in the world changes except for our immediate family and friends. If the president dies, everything changes everywhere all at once. The role is just that important that it's worth clearing every obstacle that might hinder the president from getting where they need to go. There are some things in life that are just that important. They're so important that they are worth moving everything else out of the way. And there is nothing more important than the gospel message of Jesus Christ and what he's done to save sinners. There is nothing more preeminent, more paramount than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it brings us to God. It solves the greatest human problem that we are separated from a loving father. We are enemies with him. And through the person and work of Christ, we get access to God. We get relationship with him. And it is a message that announces not you need to do all of these things, It is a gospel message. Inherently what that means is it's an announcement of good news. It is the extension of an invitation to say, this has been accomplished on your behalf if you believe. It's a word that comes, it's an ancient term that was when when warriors would come back into the city after victory, they would send a herald ahead of them to go into the city and announce to the whole city, the victory's been won, the battle is completed, you are victorious because our armies fought on your behalf. Victory comes to you. The message of Jesus Christ is just that. It is a message that comes to us as sinners and says, Jesus Christ has fought on your behalf and has won the victory over your sin and over death. If you believe in him, the victory is yours. And you have access to God fully and forever. It's the greatest news of all time. It's the most important thing that's ever happened. It's the most important piece of news that any of us could ever hear or focus on. It is absolutely critical. And it's so good that we ought to clear a road for everyone to hear it. It's so good that we ought to be diligent to make sure there is nothing in the way. There are no roadblocks. There are no boulders in the way for people that do not know Christ to hear the gospel and respond to him because it's that important. Yet, we've often stacked up many obstacles in the way of the gospel. Sure, there may be people in our lives that we want to know who Jesus is and what he's done for them. We want them to hear this message, but through our living, we have stacked up boulders along the road so that those who we want to see Christ can't see him because of the way we've been living. We've been putting obstacles in the way and saying, if you want to see Christ, well, first you have to get around these boulders and these obstacles, and then you can see them. But because the gospel is paramount, we must remove any obstacle that hinders it. 
As we come to chapter 9, Paul's continuing his response to the Corinthians. The Corinthians had been insisting that they could go to the temples and eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, we talked about this a lot last week. We'll talk about it again in the weeks to come. But now that many of these Corinthians were Christians, they had to give up the practices they were used to their whole lives. They would go to the temples. It was part of society. You'd have different temples dedicated to all kinds of different gods. And you would party there. You would enjoy, it was essentially a restaurant. You would eat these food sacrificed to idols, but... Now that they became Christians, Paul's trying to write to them and say, you can't do that anymore. You follow Jesus. Jesus is exclusive. He is the one and only God. These gods are gods made with human hands. They are not real. They don't have ears to hear you, eyes to see you. They're dead. So stop going to temples. And last week, he really focused on one reason not to continue doing this is out of love for your Christian brother. Because there are some brothers and sisters among us that in this context, maybe had a, a deeper association with some of those idols and some of those Greek and Roman gods. And, and, and when they see you go to the temple, they, they feel like this is now permission for them to get back into idolatry and turn away from Jesus and be destroyed. So out of love for your brother, don't do that. But he continues now in chapter 9 to turn his attention to also the unbeliever. He desires for the Corinthian church and for us to ensure that nothing is hindering the gospel from reaching those who do not know Christ. And in order to do that, there are some things we need to make sure aren't stuck in the way like a giant roadblock. And Paul will use himself as an example for this to the Corinthian church and for us as well. Firstly, we, we see him show us this, that because the gospel is paramount, we must hold our rights loosely. Here's the situation for Paul. Paul was deeply disrespected by this church that he planted. He came into the city. He shared the good news of Jesus, the most important message. People started to believe. And as this church was established, they became very embarrassed of Paul, the guy that started this thing. They didn't really like how he operated. He was very weak. He seemed to be very lowly. He wasn't impressive. And so they were very discouraged by Paul and they disrespected him. And one of the primary reasons is hit on right here in chapter 9. When different ministers of Jesus would come through different cities, we called them apostles, those that saw Christ and carried the message of the gospel to the nations initially in the scriptures, this role that we see here. When they would do that, they would often receive support from the cities that they would go to. So they would show up into a city, they would declare the gospel, they would preach it, and the people within that city that started to believe, they would support the work of the apostles. They would help support them practically, financially, give them housing, give them support, so that the work of ministry could continue. Paul, when he came to Corinth, didn't do that. And because he didn't do that, his apostleship was suspect, or sus. So I've learned that's a new, that's a new word today, right? <laughs> So, so his instruction of like, you should do this, you shouldn't go to temples, they, they would kind of take it all with a grain of salt. Of like, well, but Paul doesn't really take support. Is he even really a true apostle? Does he have the authority of God to say these things? Because he doesn't seem to operate the same way all the other ones do. And so they disrespected Paul for that reason. Thought he must not be a genuine apostle. And as he comes to chapter 9, he begins by saying, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? This is one of the prerequisites to be an apostle. You've seen the Lord Jesus. And are not you the seal of my apostleship? Saying, if you doubt my genuineness as an apostle, can you not just look to your left and to your right and see that there are brothers and sisters who were not followers of Jesus and now are Christians who were dead and are now alive? Are you not evidence that I have brought the gospel to you faithfully? How silly for you to assume that I'm not genuine. But then he goes further and he shows, he wants to establish this. He says, I, I want to show you, I actually do have the right to receive all kinds of support from you. The scriptures have actually given me that right to receive support from you. Even though they're saying, Paul probably doesn't have this right because he doesn't use it. He doesn't receive our support. But he wants to tell them, actually, I, I do have it. And he spends multiple verses establishing his right to receive their support until he eventually ends and says, nevertheless, I'm not taking it. So look at, look at what he says here in verses three through six. 
He starts walking through certain, certain questions saying, do I not have the right to eat and drink? Do I not have the right to have you help provide provisions for me? Do I not have the right to have companionship and to, to take a wife to accompany me and to love and to be on ministry together with? Do I not have that right like the other apostles do? Do I not have the right to refrain from working for a living? He, he says all these things essentially as almost rhetorical questions. Like, well, of course I do. Yes, I, I'm just as much as an apostle as the others that you've met. And that's what they're doing. They're comparing Paul to Peter and other apostles that they've seen and how they operate and how they're supported. Paul says, I certainly have all of those rights. I don't have to work to support myself. Paul spent a lot of his time working as a tent maker. He didn't need to do that, but he chose to do that. And he continues to say, there, there's even modern examples of this as we just look out in our regular world. Do soldiers serve at their own expense? No. Do those who plant vineyards just plant and never eat any of its fruit? No, those that labor often survive off of what they're laboring for. But there's not only just modern common day examples, he even goes to the words of Jesus. He goes to the Old Testament first. He says the Old Testament law reveals this, and it says in verse 9, that you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. What we see in God's Old Testament law, what, what the, one of the main purposes of the Old Testament law was to reveal to us the heart of God. Reveal to us his character and his nature. And what do we see in that command right there? Hey, when, a, when an ox treads the grain, don't cover up its mouth. Let him eat a little bit of it. What is God revealing about his own heart by giving them that instruction? He cares for a laboring animal. We also know from the entirety of Scripture that human beings are the only piece of creation created in God's image. So not only are we to reflect God's care for the laboring animal, but also we must remember if God cares for the laboring animal, he cares for the laboring man or woman created in his image even more. Which is why Paul says, is it for the oxen that God is concerned when he said that? Did he not certainly speak those words for our sake? He's saying there's a concept and a principle written into God's law. That God has shows mercy and care to those who labor. And what labor is more important than the spreading of the good news of Jesus? So he says, there's principles in the Old Testament law for me to receive support from you, for me to receive your financial support, your provision, for me to receive housing from you so that I don't have to work for a living to provide all of those things for myself. He continues, even down in the verse 14, to say, in the same way, even the Lord, the Lord Jesus, commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And that comes from when Jesus sent out the disciples to go proclaim the gospel, and he told them to receive the support as it comes to them. And he says, why? Because the, the laborer is worthy of his wages. So Paul says, look, I have these rights. The Bible gives them to me. Whether you believe I have them or not, I have biblical basis for these rights to receive your support. And before we talk about the fact that he turns them down, I think it's just important to focus briefly on this fact that this is how the Lord has designed things to operate. That the Lord himself has actually thought it good for those who minister in the gospel to receive their living by the gospel. It gives, the scriptures give us a biblical vision for gospel patrons. A gospel patron is somebody that comes alongside someone doing the work of ministry to support them and empower them and enable them to keep going further and further and further. Those that would give generously to support the work of certain people in the gospel. The New, the New Testament is filled with examples of this. Jesus himself received the support of three women, of, of Mary, Joanna, and Susanna. Jesus, those three women traveled with Jesus and provided for his material needs. They were gospel patrons. There were people who came around Jesus and generously gave for the work of the gospel to support it and to keep it going. Jesus himself designed it to be that way. As we turn into the, to the early church, we see this happening again and again and again. 
If you read the book of Romans at the very end, Paul commends a woman named Phoebe who may have likely even been carrying the letter of the Romans to the people to commend her for how she has generously supported the work of the gospel. Barnabas, who even accompanied Paul on, on, on much of his missions work before he did that, sold much of his property to give it for the work of the gospel. There's countless stories throughout church history as well of those who are giving generously to support the furthering work of the gospel. This is not just some modern idea. Surely there are many, countless, that have abused this and used this as a way to get rich and get comfortable. That's not the idea that the scriptures had in mind, but the simple idea that the laboring, those laboring for the gospel out of God's mercy and care provides for them and furthers the work of the gospel. As the church grows in the, earth, in, in the scriptures and continuing on, it doesn't just grow through people like Paul or really outgoing, travel from city to city, sharing the gospel, proclaiming it, planting churches. It doesn't just grow through people like Paul. It grows through people like Phoebe who come alongside and have a passion and a heart to generously provide and support. That work could not reach as far as it goes without the support, without the generosity. It extends through a variety of gifts, through a variety of people. Gospel patrons have a tremendous role to play in the work of ministry and encouragement and in fueling it and to wrap your arms around a church or a missionary or an individual and say, go, keep going. We're here for you. We love you. We support you. We help fuel you. What do you need? Let's spread the gospel together. God's given you a gifting that's different than mine. Let's do this together. We need that. Our church might not be here were it not for some gospel patrons who generously, out of love for Jesus and love for the gospel to spread, said, we will generously give to support you to help get you going. We need, this is how God's designed it. This is the body. This is the variety of gifts coming together. No one gift is greater than another. We need them all. And Paul right here is establishing this is a biblical principle. He would even say later in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he would say that the, the elder who rules well, let him be considered worthy of double honor especially those that labor in preaching and teaching. The Bible lays out this idea that those that get their, that minister, that give their lives to ministering the gospel and feeding the sheep and spreading the gospel, the Lord cares to provide for them th through that activity, through those that would generously come around and support. And yet, Paul says, I'm not taking yours. He said, I made no use of that right in verse 12. I've made no use of that right. Though I have it, though I, I have the biblical right for it, I've made no use of it. During his time in Corinth, Paul worked and supported himself in a workshop, in Aquila's workshop. If you know the couple Priscilla and Aquila, I meet them in the book of Acts. He works in a shop, making tents, supporting himself, during his time in Corinth. And the Corinthians were embarrassed by that. You're spurning our support. You're spurning our generosity. You aren't like any of the other preachers that come through here. We're embarrassed of you. You're not legit. So why did he do it? Well, he tells us. He did it to not put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. There are some rights that when we cling to them can hinder the gospel. There are some rights when we cling to them that can hinder the gospel. What kind of rights can hinder the gospel in our context? Well, Paul's been talking a lot about biblical freedoms thus far. We have tons of things that the Bible doesn't shackle us on. We have a tremendous amount of freedom to eat certain things, to wear what we'd like, to go places we'd like to go. But we're called biblically to use wisdom in how we use those rights to make sure they're not hindering the gospel. For example, the Bible doesn't shackle me with what I eat. Right? We see in the book of Acts that God declares all foods clean. I can eat bacon before the Lord 
and do something that an Old Testament Jew could not do through the work of Christ? I could enjoy those things. I could eat a lot of it. And biblically, I'm not going to look at it and say, well, I'm wrong. I, I, I'm in sin because the Bible's given me that freedom to do so. I have a right to do so. But yet, might there not be situations where clinging to that right could hinder the gospel? Certainly, there are today. I, I've been in situations with a passionately vegan friend who doesn't know Christ. And maybe my insistence on, no, let's eat. Let's eat all the animals. Let's eat all the fat and the grease and the bacon. Bring it on. Maybe that hinders their ability to hear me talk about the love of Christ. That might sound silly to you, but I've experienced that. And that's just a random example. There might be times where as we cling to things that we have the freedom to do or we have the right to do, it might actually hinder the gospel being heard. Now listen, what we can't take away is this. We can't prioritize winsomeness over truth. We can't just look at our world and say, well, these truths offend people and they're not winsome. Therefore, let's just kind of forget these truths and just go with the truths that work and win people to Christ. Because that's the goal, right? Well, no, the goal is not winsomeness over truth. When that happens, we see what we're seeing all over the place. Churches abandon the truth of God's word because they say, culture can't hear those truths anymore, so let's change the truths. That's not what the Lord calls us to. We must, we must stand with the truth of God's word even when it's unpopular. But the word must be the obstacle, not us. The truth of the gospel must be the obstacle, not my behavior. Not my pride, not my insistence. So how do we know what to hold on to and what to hold loosely? Context. Context matters a lot. A lot. We need to ask ourselves, does this hinder the hearing of the gospel in my context? Because for Paul in Corinth, that was his conclusion. Paul would oftentimes operate differently in different contexts. He's specifically choosing, when I'm in Corinth, I'm going to operate differently than some of the other apostles have. And we could probably dissect it a little bit, right? Corinth was a big place for traveling itinerant preachers to come on through. And as they'd come to a city, they'd give their big orations and they would impress people with their words and their wisdom and their rhetoric and people would throw money at them. They would support them and they would get their living off of this and it kind of became a gross culture. And it, it, there was this kind of this sense of ownership over these preachers. Well, we're the ones that support them and give to them so they'll say the things that we want them to say. Or they'll use this rhetoric and, and wisdom and language to impress the people and persuade them using all kinds of different means. Or it was, a, it was a, a, a culture that was obsessed with status. And so Paul comes into that context and says, maybe if I operate in this way, people might not hear the gospel as clearly. They might just think, oh, here's another preacher doing the same thing that all the other preachers do. And so Paul comes into this context and intentionally says, what can I do to ensure that the gospel is heard and heard clearly? And he concludes in this context to say, I'll receive none of your support. I'll come in, I'll support myself. I won't use rhetoric and wisdom in my preaching. I'll preach to you the clear gospel and it will be offensive. And so that when those of you who hear it and believe, you'll know it's about Jesus and not about being caught up in some movement of some preacher. His context helped him to discern what he needed to lay down so the gospel could be heard. It is the same for us. There are oftentimes um, many people that want to move from the United States to share the gospel in a different context and in a different country. When you do that, you have to consider the culture and the context of the place that you're going. One example, tattoos, okay? In America, tattoos generally are widely accepted. No one really bats an eye at them. I mean, not no one, 
Made plenty of people bad eyes at them. But, but tattoos in America are, don't, don't come with a ton of stigma anymore. They're, it's just kind of commonplace. They're everywhere. Certainly, it's not necessarily hindering the ministry of the work of the gospel. When you, if you have a tattoo and you walk up to somebody that's not a Christian and you share the gospel with them, they're not thinking, oh my gosh, this person has a tattoo. I can't listen to the word they're saying. <laughs> no, in our context, it doesn't make sense. But in many parts of Africa, to have a tattoo is to be directly associated with belonging to an evil force or a witch doctor. And so now you see in that context, having tattoos is going to come with a lot of difficulty for someone to hear the gospel. Because all they see and hear is, well, you're talking about this Jesus, but you do all of this evil witchcraft stuff and you belong to a witch doctor because all the tattoos you have on your body. Now, we could go there and say, well, no, I have the right. It's not wrong for me to, I have tattoos that give glory. That's a Bible verse on my forearm. I, I have the right. Well, but is your right hindering their ability to hear the gospel? Then you should probably hold it loosely and lay it down. As we were going through 2020, as our church was starting, it was a great time to start a church. It was really fun. And we were meeting in our backyard. We had conversations about masks. And I say that and all of us just got really uncomfortable. But we, we, had, we had conversations about masks. And here's what we talked about. We said, hey, listen, it might not be the same everywhere else, but in our culture, in, our, in this city, when we insist on our right to refuse to wear them, what the unbelieving parts of our city hear and see is, oh, they don't care for people. They don't care for the poor. They don't care for minorities. They're really selfish. And they don't want to listen to a word you say. So the question that we posed is, what does it look like for us to prioritize our witness over our comfort? It doesn't mean that there might not be legitimate reasons that some of us didn't wear them or whatnot. That's not what I'm saying here. Here what I am saying is that in that situation, we had conversations as an early church to say, what does it look like for us to sacrifice our comfort for the sake of witness? What does it look like for us to ensure that nothing is getting in the way of people hearing us proclaim the gospel? And that's the work that we do as we read our context and we apply the gospel to our context. So there might be certain cultural rights that we need to hold loosely. We all love freedom of speech, right? I have the freedom to say what I want to say. I can post my opinions on Facebook. I can go picket my local store. I can write all the emails that I want to write and say what I want to say. But I need to ask myself, when I'm using this right, does it put an obstacle in the way of the gospel? I have a right to do it. I have a right to use it. But I need to first ask myself, does this put a hindrance in the way of the gospel by clinging to this right? We can just look at what's happened in the course of our country over the last, I don't know, six years. With things like political passion among Christians, which is not wrong, certainly just fine. But what have we seen happen? We have seen the Christian label now evoking more political ideas than biblical ones. Even the term evangelical, which has historically throughout human history communicated something gorgeous, that you believe the message of Jesus and you are committed to sharing this gospel with everyone. That's what that word means. Now what does it mean? It's literally a political category. Now, I'm not saying that's entirely the fault of every Christian that's ever cared about politics. That's not what I'm saying. But we, we've seen some kind of catastrophic failure happen to our witness in this country. That that's what those words now evoke. That's hard. That's created an obstacle for many to hearing the gospel. So, it doesn't mean don't be passionate about politics by all means. It means you vote, care, debate, argue, share ideas, sharpen one another, all of those things. But also always ask yourself, is this hindering the hearing of the gospel? Certainly there's a way to be passionate and involved and committed in all of these areas 
and do it in a way that doesn't hinder the gospel. But oftentimes, where that question is so far from our minds because our rights are what are most important to us. They're right in front of us. I can do this. I have the freedom. I have the right. Therefore, I need to. And we don't think at all about what it does to our witness. Our rights should serve us on mission, not strip us of our witness. So if asserting your rights are more important to you than hear, people hearing the gospel, that's an idol. Often idols can be good things. Please hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying the, any of these things are inherently wrong or bad things. Many of them are great freedoms we enjoy. But do we utilize our rights to advance our agenda or advance the kingdom of God? probably had that experience before of accidentally throwing away something precious in the trash, right? You're trying to find it, you don't know where it is, and you realize, oh my gosh, I threw that away two days ago. And you have to have that delightful experience of going to the dumpster and digging through all of the bags of trash to find the thing that you're looking for. It's a disgusting experience. It's awful. You feel so degraded as you're doing this. But some of us are doing that with the gospel. We are burying it behind piles and piles and piles of other things so that if anybody wants to really see the gospel in our lives, they have to wade their way through a bunch of junk to get there. So my question is, what, why, what might we need to lay aside or loosen our grip on in order for some to be able to hear the gospel from us? You can be passionate about many things. You can enjoy many of your rights and use them faithfully, use them well to the glory of God and also make sure that they aren't hindering the most important thing, which is the gospel. Paul surrendered an irrefutable right that he had so that he could better win people to Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus did as well. Jesus laid down his irrefutable rights, things that, were, that were eternally belonged to him, that he had every right to. He said, I will lay them down for the sake of my people coming to know me and calls us to look like him. Because the gospel is paramount, we hold our rights loosely. We also hold our comforts loosely. Look at what Paul says here in verse 12. He says, nevertheless, we've not made use of this right, but what do we do instead? We endure everything anything. We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of Christ, in the way of the gospel of Christ. We endure anything. You have to imagine, there were a lot of negative consequences that came for Paul because he chose to do this. A lot of suffering for him. He had hard labor, manual labor with his hands, day in and day out. That was probably exhausting right? Work is exhausting. It requires so much from you. I'm finding myself, now that I'm in like my mid-30s, I get to the end of the day and I'm absolutely exhausted and I did nothing that day. I don't know what's happening to me. Paul was working hard labor with his hands day in and day out. That would have been taxing and exhausting on him. And it also came with social weakness. He was ridiculed. He was disrespected. He was demeaned and considered less than. And he's choosing this. He also would have had a smaller following because he couldn't dedicate as much time to preaching the gospel less people were interested because he wasn't taking their support. He had, dealt, had to deal with accusations. All of these things Paul willingly walked towards. He chose that kind of suffering so that he could offer a, a free gospel is what he calls it. I could offer the gospel free of charge. And in doing so, he actually communicates something about the gospel itself. He says, this gospel is free to you. It costs Christ everything. And yet he offers it free of charge to you who will come and believe. That's what the scriptures say. Those of you who have no, no money, come, buy, and eat. It's this invitation to those that are spiritually poor and destitute, though that you have nothing. The greatest of news is offered to you free of charge. 
simply through faith in Christ, you can be rescued and have an abundance of spiritual riches in Christ forever and ever. Paul chose suffering. He chose to be uncomfortable so that other people could better hear the gospel. Are you willing to be uncomfortable so that others can hear the gospel? I heard somebody say a couple years ago that in our culture, Christians need to be able to take a sucker punch and stay. There's a lot of cheap shots that are thrown around. As followers of Jesus, we need to be able to take those cheap shots and stay and keep loving. Instead of just rising up to our defense and defending ourselves, are we willing to be more uncomfortable than the unbeliever so that they can hear the gospel? There's a pretty simple litmus test for us if we want to answer that question, and it's this. Do you share the gospel? Do you actually open your mouth and tell people about who Jesus is? Do you open your mouth and tell people that they need Christ? That all that they're looking for is ultimately found in him, that they need to turn from their sins and follow Jesus? Because let's be honest, the primary reason most of us don't do that regularly is because we are afraid of discomfort. So in a very tangible, real way, we do not want to be uncomfortable in order for others to come to know Christ. That displays something very not the gospel. For Jesus willingly became far more uncomfortable than any of us so that we could be saved. He took the initiative in that regard. We have a Savior who chose suffering so that we could be saved. Look at what the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 gives us this invitation and this instruction to do this. It says, Jesus suffered outside of the gate. He, he, he suffered as an outcast outside of the gates of the city of Jerusalem, outside of the safety of the city. He suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify people through his blood, in order to save us. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. Let us also be treated like outcasts, like strangers, like weirdos, like just kind of crazy people sometimes. Let us bear the hatred that Christ endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the one that is to come. Because Christ suffered that we might be saved, let us also go like him and suffer so that others might be saved. And what's the power for it? It's not just, hey, go suffer. The power is because here we have no lasting city. This is not our comfort. We seek the city that is to come. You see, Paul didn't just say, I'm going to suffer. He said, I'm going to choose a different comfort. I'm going to choose the comfort that comes from knowing Christ more than the comfort that comes from being comfortable. And that's the call for us as followers of Jesus. There is a comfort that comes from knowing Him. We're called to choose, the, choose gospel comfort over everything. Intentionally, not just like, hey, well, if I have to find all of my comfort in Christ, I will, but I'd prefer not to. No, to intentionally say, I will choose the comfort of knowing Christ above every other comfort. I will intentionally say my reputation will not be my comfort. I will intentionally choose to say my success will not be my comfort. My relationships, my friendships, my companionships, my marriage will not be my source of comfort. My politics, my success, my dreams, my aspirations, my future, none of those things are going to be my comfort. I am intentionally going to choose that Christ will be my comfort. I will find what I need from him and it will come with suffering. But when you suffer for something, you testify to its greatness. 
That's why there's so much romance built up in a, in a marriage proposal. Because the man pulls out this ring that he spent thousands of dollars on. Or hundreds. I don't know. Context. <laughs> and the, 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 the sense is, you look at this and you say, wow, look at how much he sacrificed and suffered to pay for that. She must really be something. When you suffer for something, you testify to its greatness. When we suffer for Christ, we tell the world how great he is. To uphold Christ as paramount is really weird. You look really silly. You look really out of touch. To suffer to uphold Christ as paramount is foolishness. Do you ever suffer for, for, for proclaiming Christ? Do you ever sacrifice to proclaim Christ? Your unbelieving friends and family need to see you willingly suffer for Christ. Because Christ accepts me, I can share him and be rejected. Because Christ provides for me, I can proclaim him and lose anything. Because Christ is my redeemer, I can be canceled. Because Christ is my joy, I can suffer and still be happy. So is there somebody you need to willingly suffer for so they can hear the gospel? Lastly is this. We need to not just hold our rights loosely and our comforts loosely, but we need to hold our calling firmly. That's where Paul closes this. He talks about how necessity is laid upon me. Paul had a miraculous change in his life. The Lord Jesus appeared to him in a vision, knocked him off his horse, made him blind for a few days, utterly changed the course of his life, called him to share the gospel with Gentiles. That was his divine destiny, if you will. That was not Paul's plan. That was not his uh, future ideas. That was not where his investments lied. Everything changed for Paul in a moment because the Lord Jesus showed up and said, you're mine and I have a mission for you. So Paul says, necessity has been laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. That doesn't just mean I'll have this like existential bummer happening inside if I don't preach the gospel. He's literally saying, woe is me, the divine judgment I will receive if I turn away from this calling. The Lord Jesus has called me to this. But Paul's calling as miraculous as it is, is never meant to make us feel distance from Paul. It's actually meant to make us feel right alongside Paul. He says in the book of 1 Timothy, Jesus Christ died for sinners of whom I am the foremost. God showed his patience in me, to me, so that in me and through me, he might display it to you also. That my calling is also your calling. If you're a Christian, your calling to be a follower of Jesus is just as miraculous as Paul. You were dead in your sins, an enemy of God, and Lord Jesus saved you. And he gave you a calling to proclaim the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5. God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Entrusted. You can put that verse on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5. God has entrusted to us the message and the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Proclaiming the gospel to the world is your primary purpose while you're here. Is that through every inch of your life, you would give glory to God by testifying to the greatness of Jesus. That is your purpose, period. Your purpose is not your career. Your purpose is not your family. It's not your investments. It's not your legacy. Your purpose is to glorify God in everything that you do so that people look at your life and say, wow, look at Jesus. This gospel is so precious, it needs to be placed on the forefront of our lives so that people can see it and hear it clearly 
because Christ is paramount. Church, when we as God's people lay aside our preferences and our rights and our freedoms so that others can see and hear the gospel, we show Jesus to be like no one else. He is so worthy of following. I'll close with this. There's a tremendous story that many of you may be familiar with. Um, It's the story of five missionaries moving their lives to the jungles of Ecuador to reach reach the Waurani people, uh, an unreached tribe of people. Um, Jim Elliott was one of the members on that trip. They had made several friendly contacts with this tribe of people. They wanted them to know Christ. They, They wanted them to hear the gospel of Jesus and be saved. After having a few friendly encounters, they showed up one day, landed their plane, and were all murdered within minutes. Each one of these men were recently married with young families, young children at home, yet they wanted to take the gospel to where it hadn't gone yet. About two years later, the wife of Jim Elliott, Elizabeth Elliott, takes her three-year-old daughter and moves her life to this same village. Despite many people counseling her to not do this for the safety of her family, for her well-being, don't do this. Here's what Elizabeth Elliot said. She said, as long as this is what the Lord requires of me, then all else is irrelevant. She stayed there. She preached the gospel and it spread and many people came to know Christ. Seven years later, one of the sons of the man who was murdered, his name was Steve Saint, was baptized in a river in that village by two of the men that killed his father and had recently become Christians. It's a crazy story. A a crazy story of willingly walking towards suffering, of willingly laying aside rights and freedoms and passions and dreams and all these things so that those that don't know Christ may hear him. And their suffering testified to the goodness of Jesus. And friends, that doesn't just happen in remote villages in Ecuador. That happens in our cities. That happens in our families and our workplaces. When we lay aside those things and show Christ to be like no one else. So let's show people. Let's show people who he is. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, We thank you that you gave up your life. You gave up your joys, your freedoms, your comforts, your rights, everything that belonged to you. To come to earth as a servant. You may give your life as a ransom for many. Jesus, that is the story we joyfully sing for all of eternity. We sing of your sacrifice, that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, what a joy it is to belong to you, and yet, Lord, you also want to make us like you. We are your ambassadors. You are making your appeal to a dying world through our witness. What a tremendous honor and joy it is to have that role, Lord Jesus, that you've chosen us for. We want to steward it well. Lord Jesus, we know there are certainly so many things that are important in our world, so many things we need to be involved in and care about and passionate about, even many biblical things that we need to stand for and hold to. Yet, Lord Jesus, we know that we are often very susceptible to getting distracted, and so we just ask for your help. Would you help us be laser-focused on the good news? Would you give us a love for our neighbors a love that drives us to recognize they're actually dying without you, Jesus, and they need to know you and they need to hear you. And would you give us the strength and the courage to walk towards discomfort and suffering so that they might see you? And Jesus, we know that as we do that, you will increase our joy because you love to provide for those who are laboring for the gospel. So Jesus, would you help us in our weakness? We need you. We cannot muster up the strength on our own to do this. We need your power. 
and your strength and your grace. Thank you that you are so delighted to empower us for this journey. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.